great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Will Weir. I'm a local business owner and volunteer and etc. Uh, ranch Camp and Priya America. Uh huh. Oh, questions starting already. Talk about dialogue. Okay. Land acknowledgement, um, and that is, uh, there were many uh, sovereign, and are many sovereign nations in this area. So I, if anybody thinks of one that I haven't listed, let me know, but I have the Ute, the Hickory Apache, Kiowa, Arapaho, and not far from here, Navajo, and Kiwa, and Tiwa. Anybody else know of? A tribe that could be acknowledged. All right, thank you. Be aware there is a live recording, so if you're not um, seeking um, to be recorded, then don't get in front of the camera and don't talk too loud. Um, that's best I can come up with there. Um, I want to acknowledge Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. That's a, um, it's part of many of our traditions, uh, sacred time. Um, we wanted to say thank you, uh, Kayvon uh, Kalatbari, for the generous use of this facility and donation of refreshments and just the amazing um, contribution to our town and this area. Uh, the Mountain Forum for Peace uh, provided generous donation um, uh, for costs as, uh, as did the Episcopal Church and other groups. Uh, Los Animas Colfax Forum for Peace and Justice KRTN Radio, the Ratonian, the World Journal, and the shops and the places that allowed us to put up our signs. Um, and just thank all of you for being here and our speaker, uh, Mr. Rob Prince. Um, he's going to share some knowledge about the, the land and the history of Palestine. Uh, I understand that uh, one thing he has in mind is to kind of start with the present situation and then um, kind of fill it in. Now, I want to make a comment. You know, these, just like with mentioning Easter, um, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about that is activating in our bodies and in our minds and our spirits. There's been a lot of conflict in this world. There's been a lot of violence. And people that are concerned and want peace came together to schedule this and selected a speaker. And we want to hear what this speaker says. You don't have to agree. Um, and there'll be a time for uh, questions or dialogue. So, and if, if you think that some whole other topic should be on this stage or in some stage, please let me know. I, I have this rule of thumb. If, if, if three people or more can agree on something that needs to happen, I'll help you support it. <laughs> it doesn't, in this town, if you can get more than two people to agree on something, I think it should be discussed. <laughs> but if you can't even find one person to agree with you on what needs to be talked about, then work on your social skills. That's my idea. Um, Mr. Prince is a retired senior lecturer of International Studies at the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Relations for the last 13 years. Um, his uh, Denver University Corbell colleague, Imam Ibrahim Kazaruni. Uh, they've been uh, monthly political commentators on KGNU, the Hemispheres, Middle East Dialogues, former Peace Corps volunteer, staff member in Tunis, uh, Tunisia, U.S. Secretary of World Peace Council from 85 to 90, uh, where he worked along uh, with other peace movements worldwide on nuclear disarmament and Middle East peace issues. Um, anything else, anybody, before we get started? Thank you, Mr. Prince.
Well, uh, let me start off by saying uh, how glad I am to be here. And uh, what I, I want to share some thoughts with you. My idea was not to talk, f well, between 30 and 40 minutes. And I, I can't see my wife, Nance, but I did ask her if I went on beyond that to stop me. All right? And she's good at that. Uh, so there's that part of it. But part of the reason is I, would li I hope it becomes a dialogue. All right? Uh, that's really more what I'm here for is just kind of to, to try to exchange some thoughts with you, some ideas with you. Um, so I wanted to get that out. And then, in, uh, oh, Nancy. My microphone is not on. Can you hear me? Switch microphones. Switch microphones? Okay. All right. How's that? Ooh. Yeah, it's loud. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I know Raton a little bit coming, coming south from Denver. Not, not very well at all. Um, but there are a couple things about it that have always uh, stuck in my mind. One is uh, some miles east of you, there's that Folsom site where, you know, 10, 11,000 years ago, uh, some probably mammoth hunters uh, brought, down, brought down a mammoth. I, I, I'm presuming that's what it was. I, I really would like to go see that site. And then, of course, I, I know that it's not exactly where Ludlow is, but, but uh, that this is mining country and that, um, that just on the other side of Raton Pass is uh, the sites, frankly, of one of the most important events in, in American labor history, the Ludlow Massacre that maybe not immediately, but it's really without that massacre there would not have been unionization of the mines. So I consider this, this place um, sacred for things that mean a lot to me, this whole, this whole region. Uh, and I, I wanted to note that. The other thing I wanted to just kind of bring out is, you know, here we are in Raton, and uh, why are we talking about Gaza? And is there some connection between stuff going on in Raton and, and Gaza? And, uh, and of course there is, beyond the fact that it's one world, all right? And wherever something that's happening that's so disturbing and really obscene as, uh, as what's happening in Gaza today, we're all concerned about it. But I think there's another connection, and the connection is this. You know, I look around this town, and, and by the way, I come in here, and who do I meet? Kayvon, guy who owns this theater. I know Kayvon. I, I, I worked for Kayvon to be mayor of Denver <laughs> when he was running for Denver. I had no idea that he, that, that, that he was here. But I mention it because he was talking about all of the, um, well, not all, but some of the state funding that's gone into development here. And, you know, I hope that, uh, that this region does, does grow, and, you know, in a sustainable way, of course. But beyond that, there's so many small towns in the United States, like Raton, that once had an industry that was vibrant, so in this case, mining. In southern Colorado, there's a, a bunch of, of um, uh, sugar beet plants. The towns, they were very prosperous. Then, then obviously, you know, all know this, uh, the industry shut down for whatever reason, and, and the towns are in trouble. Okay, we live in a very, very wealthy country. You all know that. Rather than, that, than the money that this country has being used to develop a place like Raton in a sustainable way, that money is being basically used for, for, for the military, for that military budget, for the, for the 800 bases around the world, for the interventions that our, our government has been involved in. So the starting point of this talk is that money that's being used for war, whether it's in Gaza or in Syria or wherever, that money should be coming here and that money should be used for development. And one of the first things we want to say is we need to cut that military budget 
and we need to reorganize where that fund's going to, to human needs and to dealing with the problems of our country. Okay, um, I wanted to start off in terms of talking about what's going on in Gaza, and I made uh, a number of, you know, wrote up some notes, uh, and then yesterday I saw a statement by a former member of the State Department who had just quit, and she had quit over Gaza. And I read that statement, and it was, it, it said pretty much what I wanted to say a lot more poetically and beautifully, and I want to read, I want to read parts of it. I want to add that she is the third high-level member of the State Department to quit over U.S. policy in Gaza. The first is a guy named Josh Paul, and I mentioned Josh Paul because I had the good fortune of interviewing him on KGNU in Boulder after he had quit. And what George Paul, what um, Josh Paul had done was he was the guy in the State Department that okayed or vetoed arms sales. And basically, the reason he quit was all the arms sales that were, going, that were going to Israel at the same time that the United States at least, you know, formally was talking about, oh, well, you know, we're concerned about the, the civilian population of Gaza and, oh, we have to give them food aid. But there's this contradiction. You're giving them food aid at the same time you're arming them to the teeth. And yesterday I read that there's another, in the midst of, of, of all of the things that are going on in U.S. policy and some of Biden's more recent statements, um, the, biggest, the biggest transfer of U.S. arms to Israel is taking place. And these, these are weapons of a particular strength. So they're, I don't, I used to know a lot about weapons and then I got so bored with the subject uh, the one that got me was there was a missile that could go out into a couple hundred miles and then it could hang out and wait for the target to come. And after that I said, I am so tired of shit I can't stand it. So I know they're making all kinds of new weapon systems, but these bombs are 500 pound bombs, they're 1,000 pound bombs, they're 2,000, those bombs, that. They're not nukes, but they're very, very close. So at the same time that the administration uh, was abstaining at the United Nations on a ceasefire resolution, making it look like maybe, maybe we're, you know, we're moving in a direction, inching towards peace, we're giving Israel the worst, the, the most destructive bombs that, that we can. So th that's what's, anyhow, uh, um, I want to read just at least a portion of, um, of what this wonderful woman had to say. And I think I got it here, let's see. Yes, all right. So I, I'm gonna read three or four paragraphs. This is how it begins. Since Hamas attack on October 7th, Israel has used American bombs in its war in Gaza, which has killed more than 32,000 people, 13,000 of them children, with countless others buried under the rubble according to the Gaza Ministry of Health. Israel is credibly accused of starving the two million people who remain, according to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. A, a group of charity leaders warns that without adequate aid, hundreds of thousands more will soon likely join the dead. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, all right, a couple of more paragraphs on this. For the past year, I work for the office devoted to promoting human rights in the Middle East. I believe strongly in the mission and in the important work of that office. However, as a representative of a government that is directly enabling what the International Court of Justice has said could plausibly be a genocide in Gaza, such work has become almost impossible. Unable to serve an administration that enables such atrocities, I have decided to resign from my position at the Department of State. And it takes some courage to resign from a high level position in the, in, in the, in the State Department. Let's see, a couple more of these just to give you. Um, let's, well, she talks about her own future. 
Across the federal government, employees like me have tried for months to influence policy, both internally and when that failed publicly. My colleagues and I watched in horror as this administration delivered thousands of precision-guided munitions, bombs, small arms, and other lethal aid to Israel, and authorized thousands more, even bypassing Congress to do so. We are appalled by the administration's flagrant disregard for, the Ameri for American laws that prohibit the U.S. from providing assistance to foreign militaries that are engaged in gross human rights violations and that restrict the delivery of humanitarian aid. Some have argued that the United States lacks influence over Israel, yet retired Major General Yitzhak Brick noted in November that Israel's missiles, bombs, and airplanes all come from the United States. The minute they turn off the tap, you can't, uh, the minute they turn off the tap, you can't keep fighting. Everybody understands we can't fight this war without the United States weapons, period. All right, there was one more thing I read this morning, if I can find it here, just adding to, you know, to the overall genocide. And this has to do with the environmental impact that, uh, of, of, the, of the Israeli bombing of Gaza. Olive trees and farms have been reduced to patched earth. Soil, ground, water have been contaminated by munitions and toxins. The sea is choked with sewage and waste. The air polluted, polluted by smoke and particulate matter. Researchers and environmental organizations say the destruction will have enormous effects on Gaza's ecosystems and biodiversity. The scale and potential long-term impact of the damage have led to calls for all to be regarded as an ecocide and investigated as a possible war crime. But American munchkins can slaughter people while destroying the environment all they want. They're supposedly defending, quote, their democracy. And yet not a word from Europe's main green parties. Nothing like obedient boys and girls they are, quiet about it all, a most disgraceful silence. Okay. Um, I don't think I have to go through what it is that Palestinians are going through in Gaza today. Uh, the bombing, uh, the attacks on, civi on civilians. Um, it's, uh, I was talking to a Palestinian uh, sister yes yesterday about this, and she's, she is somebody who has lived through uh, the, the occupation of the West Bank. She comes from near Ramallah, uh, and, and has seen some pretty heavy stuff but basically, she, what she said is she never dreamed in a million years that the situation would, would disintegrate into what it has disintegrated into uh, today. And you know, every waking hour, uh, my friend Linda Badwan, she's out, there, she's out there organizing for peace. All right, but here we are. We're here in, um, in the United States. And in one sense far away, but in another sense, it's our country. With, without support of the United States, this cannot happen, period. All right, it, it's, it, it cannot happen uh, at all. And from the very beginning, it's from after October 7th, it's been clear that something needed to be done to stop the fighting. And the something is a very well-known international call for an immediate total ceasefire. So I want to talk about why a ceasefire is in the interest, first of all, of Palestinians, which is pretty obvious, but also in the interests of Israelis, and finally, in the interests of, of our country and our, and, and our people, the American country and people. So in, in terms of the Palestinians, it's obvious. I mean, you know, without, it, w without a ceasefire, uh, there's no, a ceasefire will at least stop the, the, the most aggravated parts of this, of this genocide which is taking place. Um, it, it, without a ceasefire, there can, be, there can be no redevelopment. There can be no people going back to their homes in the north of Gaza. Um, there, there, can, there can be no way to help those that are starving. 
we, you, cannot, you, can, you cannot in any way, frankly, even if these, these, uh, these awful people who are blocking with the consent of the Israeli government, obviously, aid from coming in to Gaza, you can't do that in the middle of a war. So in, in order to, to begin to deal with the humanitarian crisis, we need a ceasefire. Okay, that's number one. The, sec the, the second thing about a ceasefire, in the world we're living in, you're either preparing for more war or you're preparing for peace. A ceasefire is really the first initial step to turn this situation around. There have been an awful lot of Middle East wars. Very few have lasted as long as this one. They tend to last two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month. We're now into, in, into six months, which is really historic. But at the same time, someday, this war is going to end too. And, what's, and, and a ceasefire, without a ceasefire, we can't do that. But what a ceasefire does is it turns the momentum around. Rather, rather than arguing about uh, how, how can we stop this or whatever, uh, what, what, if it, without a ceasefire, the, the war escalates. That's what I'm trying, it escalates, it, it's already escalated some, we can talk about that, Lebanon and other places, what the Yemenis are up to, but it will escalate more and at a certain point, it becomes more than a regional war. So we want to, we want to stop this war, not just for, for the Palestinians and Israelis, but, but really for the danger of wh where, this, where this can go. And that's gonna be followed by a very complex political negotiation so, o o over this, how do we resolve this, this issue? And we can, we can talk about that too later. But without a ceasefire, we can do none of that. So ceasefire both on the humanitarian level, if you like, and also uh, beyond, beyond that in terms of the political resolution of the conflict is necessary. Our government has, well, it finally uh, abstained in a UN Security Council vote, which is, which is positive. But if you look at the vote, it called for a ceasefire during Ramadan. Well, Ramadan's going to be over in a week. So it's, it's a, it was a very limited uh, time frame. And then, of course, uh, uh, once the Security Council had agreed to the ceasefire after the U.S. had vetoed three previous attempts, then the United States say, well, it's non-binding. Well, by international law, it is binding. So the fact that, that the Biden administration is kind of coming up with its own explanation of how ceasefires work, um, this, is, this is another indication that they're still not serious, they're still not serious about peace. Okay, how about the Israelis? Uh, how does a ceasefire benefit them? Well, it's not known so well, but Israel is suffering too from this war. Um, Israel has gotten more of a bloody nose in this war than it has ever gotten before. There are, I, I keep seeing different numbers for the numbers of, um, of internal refugees. So the Israeli communities that are right near Gaza, those people have all left, they've moved north. And on the other side, in the north, the area, northern borders of Israel with southern Lebanon, where Israel is in conflict with Hezbollah, the, uh, the, the Lebanese militia group, there's a 10 mile strip in northern Israel which was heavily populated. That has been depopulated now because of the war. The numbers of Israelis that uh, have been displaced by this war, I've seen different statistics so I'm not sure, but I've, I, the statistics I've seen is between 250,000 and half a million, all right? Secondly, there are reports you certainly can read them in the uh, uh, Hebrew press, but they're also coming a little bit in the American press too. Uh, so many, so many of the people in the Israeli military have PTSD. Uh, it, this is a country in trauma today over this war as well. Beyond that, this war is unsustainable economically for Israel. 
Israel's being hit all over the place. The fact that you have 250,000 Israelis who are not being productive and who the government has to support, you know, in temporary housing, whatever, there's, there's that part of it. Um, there's a flood of Israelis who are leaving. Interesting, where are they going? They're going to Cyprus, which is a whole other story we could get into. Um, beyond that, there's something else that's happening, and it's in really in Israel's interest to, to, end, to end this war. Um, Israel is emerging as the pariah state in the world today. Today, what Israel, what, what Israel is becoming, when, once you leave the US or Western Europe, but for much of the rest of the world, it's, it's, it's the South Africa of today. It's the South Africa of today. Um, and this, this is not simply just a public relations thing. This translates into the loss of economic ties, the loss of, of, of political prestige. Uh, and the longer this war goes on, the harder it is for Israel uh, to, to in, in, in any way kind of salvage uh, salvage its reputation and the economic and political consequences for that. So, so it is in, it, in Israel's interest too. It's, it's, it's in Israel's interest too to work for a ceasefire. Now, what I've noticed here, how much time do I have, Nance? Okay, all right. Doesn't mess around, I told you. Um, Okay, what was I just saying? I'm terrible. This is what happens when you turn 80. Um, all right, the, oh yeah, well the, the economic uh, the impact, the economic in, impact on, on Israel. Now right, let's turn to the United States now. What has this war done to the US reputation in the world? It's hurt it badly. It's hurt it bad. The, United, the Biden administration, and, and by the way, for those of you on, on, on the coming election, neither of these candidates are good on this issue, all right? So, so I'm not saying don't vote. No, actually, I wouldn't say that at all. But the idea that one is better than the other, they're both terrible. They're both terrible on this. Um, this is hurting the United States. There's no way that the United, you know, the United States has tried to say, well, we're the mediator. We're the impartial me mediator between Israel and the Palestinians. That absolutely, that absolutely does not fly uh, uh, today. The whole world sees that w without US support, uh, whether it's financial, whether it's military, whether it's political, like at the UN, uh, Israel could not conduct this war. It's never, been, it's, ne it's never been clearer. So US prestige in the world is hurting because of this. This has all kinds of consequences. Again, the consequences, they don't happen overnight. Um, but but you, the United States is losing its, uh, you know, again, we want to be a little careful how we put it. But its prestige is going down. And it's being hurt by this war. And it's being hurt by its one-sided blind support of Israel. So, so whether it's from the Palestinian perspective, whether it's from the perspective of, of Israeli citizens, or, or whether it's from the, from the perspective of US global interests, all benefit from, from a ceasefire from, from where I'm sitting. And the arguments against it to me have always been uh, very, very weak excuses, uh, if, if you like. So, so ceasefire to me, I mention it because that's what we in this room can do. We can work for a ceasefire. How? It's the usual, you know, knock your head against the wall way. We contact our members of Congress. Uh, it's very important. We're doing it in Denver like we've never done it before. And believe me, they're not used to hearing these voices the way, the, the way that, uh, th that, that these voices have come to the fore of late. And other ways. Nothing is more important to ending the genocide, ending the war, and moving in a direction of Middle East peace than a ceasefire. 
I can't, I can't em emphasize it enough. All right, final point, I wanna just briefly talk about the nature of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict itself. Um, because the way that it's spun, both by the government, our government, and also the media, you have this impression that what you're dealing with are two independent countries. Oh, there's Israel and there's uh, Palestinians. And the relationship is not that way. Basically, what the relationship between Israel and Palestine is, it, the, the best way to explain it, it's a form of what's called settler colonialism. All right, and, and if you understand that, you begin to see things in a very different way. Now, what, is that just, uh, you know, Rob Prince's rhetoric uh, that this is settler colon? This is the United Nations. Every single resolution, whether from the General Assembly or the Security Council that has dealt with this issue, views the situation be, that, that the Palestinians are a colonized, occupied people. And colonized, occupied people have certain rights. They, uh, and, and also, colonizers have certain responsibilities towards their occupied people, the the people who have been occupied. Um, I, I am not somebody who uh, celebrates violence and never have. Uh, um, just, you know, if you give me a hand grenade, it'd probably blow up in my hand. I don't know anything about weapons, and war is something. If I'm here, it's because I have seen war in a place called Algeria, and whatever I can do to avoid it, I, I, I try to do. But I do defend the right of oppressed peoples to struggle for their independence, whatever that takes. And when one looks at it from that perspective, and when one looks at what Palestine has been, 75 years, an seven, well, a little bit more than that, an occupied country, uh, this conflict cannot end until the occupation of the Palestinian people ends and that there is a state, a state for them. The framework, I just assume it's the same framework we've heard about for decades. We can talk about how feasible that is, i.e. a state for the Palestinians, in the West Bank and Gaza, capital in East, in East Jerusalem, and a state for Israel within its 1967 borders. So there's a framework for peace. It's been out there for a long time. Uh, I don't see this issue ending soon, but I think we've just turned the corner with this war. And hopefully that, as with other wars, the when this war ends, that's when the hard stuff comes. How do we create the peace? And really, that's why I'm here talking to you, to try to create the peace. I'll stop there and open it up to you, and thank you for inviting me to your wonderful little town. All right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, this Somebody uh, want to holler out a question? I have some here that was, were handed to me. Oh, you, you have one. Okay, very good. This is very organized. You want to do yours first or mine? No, no, go ahead. All right. How do you think Americans can best contribute to serving health care and emergency medical needs of Palestinians? Do you need me to read that in the microphone? Can, can, oh, yeah. can you, I'll repeat it. Uh, how do you think Americans can best contribute to serving health care and emergency medical needs of Palestinians? It's part, of, part is just a rep re repetition of what I've just said. First is a ceasefire. Frankly, once we have a permanent ceasefire, there are so many American, United Nations, European, uh, add to it everybody else, Chinese, uh, Arab countries that are going to pitch in. So th th that's ready. Th they're ready to do that. 
one thing to add to this, and one of the talks that I gave was at um, University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, and one of the people on the panel was an expert on disasters. Um, she's terrific. I remember her first name is, she's a sociologist, Michelle. I don't remember her last name. But, I mean, she, she talked about the impossibility of humanitarian aid during war, which should be obvious, but we don't hear about it. And, and she had just so many different plans that could be put in, put in motion. So once again, the barrier to this is a political barrier. It's the question of ceasefire. And afterwards, m m my sense is the whole world is going to contribute to the, re to, to the rebuilding uh, of, 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 of Palestine. So that's the, the problem at this point is not how do we do it. The problem is a political one and how do we stop the fighting. So let's see what the next one is. Yes? What? Oh, that's right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, um, the organization that uh, the groups in Denver, or in, the, De in, the, in, in uh, the front range of Colorado, have been contributing to is called, what's it called again, Nance? It's the Palestine Human Rights Children's, Children's Relief Fund. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I want to just speak a minute about the, the movement for peace in Colorado, which I'm more familiar with than, than here in New Mexico. I've never seen anything like it. Starting with the Palestinian community itself, which I, I don't know the size of it, but it's mobilized. I've never, in a way that's just very dramatic and persistent and they're just doing wonderful things. And what's happened because, because they have taken the lead is several, several things. First of all, um, other peace and left groups want to work with them. And so you know the left, the ping pong ball, everybody's competing with it. Uh-uh, that's not how that works. So it's been kind of a, a unified left that, uh, and in, in coordination with Palestinians. But what I want to add to this is there are now Jewish groups and they're very, very serious about about justice for the Palestinians. They're critical of, of Israel. There's two of them. One, one is called Jewish Voice for Peace, which maybe some of you are familiar with. And the other is called Not in Our Name. And I mentioned, I'm, by the way, I'm Jewish. Um, and for a long time, let me just say, there weren't many of us in Denver who were critical of Israel. And those of us that were, and we don't need to exaggerate it, but let's just say we weren't given big hugs by the community, all right? Now, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm going to meetings of Jewish Voice for Peace. I let the young ones take care of it. I'm not trying to, and they do. There are 40, 50 people, and there's two of us over the age of 40. And, and in fact, these young people, they organized the civil disobedience for ceasefire on, those of you who know Denver, on Spear, Volvoad, and Champer. And we blocked traffic for an hour, 50, and I went with them. I couldn't let these young kids just go by themselves. Actually, they could have done it very well without me. And 15 of us have been arrested. We're going to be going on trial uh, on, a, not, not big charges, but still. Still, young Jews, young Jews who are anti-Zionist, they say it up front, they, uh, they were, they, they're doing everything that they can. And by the way, their parents are in the ADL and APEC. Uh, so it's very interesting, i.e. there's a vibrancy to, to, the, to the movement in Colorado, the likes of which I have never seen. And I've been involved in this movement for half a century in Denver. So I wanted, to raise, I wanted to raise that. Do you have some more of those questions? That I think we're down to just maybe five minutes left uh, in the whole presentation. Um, so if somebody has a question, please From the floor. Uh, give it to Nancy. And, um, one question that was here that I don't know that you covered very much is that idea of the f that, that there's a law against what we're doing. And, and oh, absolutely. Yes. People, people talk about we need the rule of law. 
um, then why are the people that preach about the rule of law not following the law? Is there a, is there a, is there a something you can say about that? Well, there's two themes to international law. One is what comes out of the United Nations, all right, and, and the International Court of Justice, which is connected to it. And there is a whole body of international law, and that deals with many questions, trade, but it deals with genocide, too. Okay, then there's the U.S. approach, which is called the rule-based orders. And basically, it's the United States makes up the rules. <laughs> In, in which way they follow. So for example, the State Department is saying there's no genocide taking place in Gaza. This official statement of the State Department today, I, I'm, that's why this last woman, why, why she quit, was, was in part, um, part of that. So, so we basically have international law that everybody else has to abide by, and then we have the United States making up its, its own version of its rule-based rule order that, that nobody else has really approved of. So there was somebody that had a hand over there or, or oh, okay, thank you. Yes, I, w I would just like to uh, make a few comments. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the Palestinian people, um, but I think we have to have an honest discussion about Hamas. Okay. And what Hamas has done, and uh, not whitewash it. Uh, when the attack happened on October, we had innocent civilians yes. killed, women, children, non combatants. We had, even though it was an uneasy peace, we had peace prior to that. Also, Hamas has had the Gaza Peninsula and that property for over five years since the last peace negotiation and has done absolutely nothing for the Palestinian people. It is difficult for me to understand why Israel is the only country that when they defend themselves, somehow they're doing something mm -hmm. wrong. Okay. There's a great deal of anti-Semitism in this country. When I hear young people who don't know their history saying, from the river to the sea, they're basically chanting an anti-Semitic remark to remove Israel. Well, let, let, him, let him finish. And Israel is here to stay. Okay. One of the very basic beginnings of peace is to acknowledge its existence to exist. Hamas will not do this. It is very difficult to have peace negotiations when one side is committed to the other's destruction. It is frustrating, but for a person who, and I do support Israel, mm -hmm. from a family standpoint, from my children's standpoint, um, I'll just briefly say that I've had children fight in both the recent war in Afghanistan and Iran, and I've had children participate with the IDF. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You know that uh, you have you've made a lot of points, and I I want to just deal with with one of them because it's it's you hear it often, and and you reflected that position, and that has to do with uh, with Hamas. Uh, and and, Octo and a little bit about October 7th, but all right, so a little perspective here. Um, when, when I first got involved and felt like I have, to, I have to take a position on this issue, why? Because I'm Jewish, they're doing it in my name, the Israelis, okay? So that's where I'm coming from on that. 
But in those days, and we're talking about after the 1973 war, a little bit, you know, a while ago, what was it, uh, in, order to, um, in order to make peace, there was a consensus in the world, but not in the U.S. or Europe, and that was the United States had to re recognize the Palestine Liberation Organization. Why? Because the Palestine Liberation Organization was the representative of the Palestinian people. All right? For years, what I argued was the United States should recognize the PLO. Okay. How was that received? Ah. Oh, the PLO is a terrorist organization, you know, Prince, you, you're supporting terrorists, blah, 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 blah. All right. Fast forward 15 years, who is the United States negotiating with in Oslo, or e actually even before that, with the PLO, i.e., the PLO was the representative of the Palestinian people. It's not up to Washington or Tel Aviv or anyone else to decide who represents the Palestinian people. They will decide. Okay, so that brings us to Hamas. Um, I was reading something this morning, Nancy uh, shared it with me, that one of the reasons this war continues, and there are different reasons, but one of them is that Israel doesn't want to, will not negotiate with Hamas. All right, and that if the war ends, it will have to negotiate with Hamas. Now, you know what? I used the same logic before as I'm using here. The Palestinian people will decide who their representative is. I don't see, I literally don't see how Hamas is not going to be a part of that, although I, what role they're going to play is, is, not, is, is not clear. So you, my friend, uh, um, I, I respect, you know, you, you articulate a, 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 cer a certain position. Um, for me, what we're seeing in the news about Hamas is simply the continuation of what used to be said about the PLO. Now let's talk about October 7th a little bit, because that's, you know, and it was, whatever happened on that day, and I'm not here to defend, whatever the Palestinians did, and it was not just Hamas, there were other organizations involved, what Israel has done is 500 times worse, all right? There's no comparison. That's the first point I want to make on that. Secondly, what's coming out in the news about October 7th? I mean, it's a, it was a messy, terrible thing. It was war, okay, unquestioned. What were the first things we heard? Oh, Hamas, they decapitated the heads of Israeli babies. This is utter nonsense, and the Israelis had had to withdraw that statement. The next thing we've heard, and we're still hearing it, by the way, is, oh, those Hamas, they were raping the women. What's the problem with that? Israel has yet to provide any evidence of one woman that has been raped. Okay, thirdly, now, I mean, the Israeli press is talking about this. A good number of those people that were killed on October 11th were killed by the IDF that was out of control and couldn't, couldn't tell the difference, i.e., what Israel tried to make out of October 11th, October 7th, was September 11th here. That was their version of September 11th. That narrative is literally unwinding before, before our eyes. And the bottom line is this, because there are other points you made, but I think the main thing, you know, the main point has to do with Hamas as far as I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. The news that we have gotten about the Palestinians throughout their history has been so distorted and so biased. And so for me, I mean, when I heard about October 7th, what's going on here? But it was interesting to me how fast the arguments from the Israeli side
began to unravel. And th those arguments are important. Why? Because that is the Israeli defense for the genocide. They're using October 7th to say, look what, look what Hamas did on October 7th. Now, Octo one last point about this. October 7th did have, on a whole other level, so let's leave Hamas aside if, if you can. It shattered. It shattered the myth. It shattered a number of myths. One, that Israel is a safe place for Israelis. Israel could not defend its own uh, people uh, at that time. It also shattered the myth since what's happened, the notion that Israel, only democracy in the Middle East and all, and all that kind of stuff. So we are now in a whole new situation. It's very fluid and very complex, okay? And I don't know where it's going. All I know is if we don't have a ceasefire, there's no way that we, regardless of the very complicated path to peace. Without that, um, what we're gonna see is, is uh, more bloodshed and not just on the hands of the Palestinians. So I, I know there's more to what you said, but that's all I could answer. All right, there's a question here. Yes. And this will be our final one, unless uh, right. somebody with a higher ranking than me can tell me otherwise. Thank you. Uh, my name's my name is Tom Kobach. Um, I just I had a couple of things that came up. Uh, one, you you were talking about the the U.S. and international law. There is a U.S. law that prohibits arms sales yes. when that recipient is interfering with humanitarian assistance. That law is being violated. And I don't understand why we don't have some group like the ACLU or somebody filing a mandamus forcing the United States government to enforce their mm -hmm. own law. Two, um, You're right. I think it's very important to look at the motivations for the government of Israel. And let's, let's always remember that there is a difference between a country it's government and a country's people. Uh, and the All government right. of Israel, uh, specifically Netanyahu, is benefiting from this war. His approval ratings are in the teens because of exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. he, he was asleep at the switch. Mossad completely right. fell down. The IDF um, was, was late to react. And then when yeah. they did, they killed some of their own people. Uh, the, the Israeli people are furious with how, how mm -hmm. this is being handled, and the only thing that's keeping him in office is the continuation of this war. Agreed. And then, and then mm -hmm. finally, what um, the old saying, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, the United States is supplying weapons to somebody who is keeping food from getting to women and children and civilians. That's, that is not dispensable. It's not a part of self-defense to starve civilian populations. That is a war crime. Thank so, you. So that's just not. All right, I, I think your comments are well taken. Uh, I only want to add one, I agree with, particularly about the, the laws of, uh, what giving weapons uh, uh, to countries that are interfering with humanitarian aid, and that, that is against you. It is against U.S. law. That's true. I wanted to come back though to um, to what's what are Israel's plans here, and I want to give you kind of a framework. So I don't know. Have any of you familiar with Nancy Klein? Uh, not Nancy. Naomi Klein's work, uh, the Shock Doctrine. Okay, so, so the, you know, my un I thought that was a brilliant work. So this came out after 9-11. Uh, uh, Naomi Klein, is a, she's a Canadian environmentalist. Uh, she is on Democracy Now! a lot, you know, programs like that. But in this book, The Shock Doctrine, she talked about how great powers can implement unpopular policies 
and that what they do is they wait for either uh, a natural disaster, so the hurricane in, in um, New Orleans is one example, and then the whole place got restructured, if you like, and people got expelled, or, uh, hit, or uh, a natural, uh, a, a human event, a war. So her point in terms of 9-11 was, okay, 9-11 happens, terrible tragedy. By the way, my name is Robert J., my cousin J. Robert. He was the head chef in the restaurant on the top of the, top of the um, Twin Towers. And he had gone in that day, he wasn't even working. He just went in that day to help with the problem. And six months later, they identified his finger. Um, so, okay, but 9-11, all right? You use an event like that to implement an entirely bigger project. So after 9-11, that's when the plans were set in motion for the US to go into Iraq. And remember, there were, besides the whole question of weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist, there was the attempt to make the connection between Saddam Hussein uh, and, and the Taliban and you know, all that stuff, which was, which was nonsense. I.e., you have an event in which something terrible happens, and then an agenda, which has been you know, sitting in the draw, is then taken out and pushed. That's what Israel is doing in Gaza right now exactly what they're doing. So they're using this event for what? To ethnically cleanse Gaza, to expand, uh, to, ex to expand Israel, uh, and, and, to and to recolonize Gaza. Uh, so so that's, what we're, that's, what, that's what we're seeing there, and, and that's the plan that Netanyahu is pushing, and that plan has the support, certainly, of the Israeli government at, uh, at this point. There's no question about it. So they're, they're also doing a kind of, if you like, a shock doctrine kind of uh, a maneuver in, uh, on all this, or trying to. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you uh, for your respect. These are hard topics. Uh, no matter where you stand in this world, there is too much suffering, right. and we're digging in. We're digging in, making, being more and more partisan and angry at each other. Um, but thank you so much, all of you, and Mr. Prince. Thank you. And I want to thank you for for inviting me here. I mean it. I'm so glad to be here and. To, to share. All, look, all I am is a teacher. That's all I've ever been. So that's all I'm trying to do now. Okay, take care.